Gracious God, you speak to us through delightful stories about servants of old who were called forth by your love and by your touch. And by this message from Paul that calls all of us, in fact challenges all of us, charges all of us to be unified in one spirit so that we can full, grow into the full stature of Christ. This day, may we hear this word in fresh words, celebrating the ways in which we have responded and committing ourselves to continue to be the body of Christ in this time and this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been in love with the church my entire life. As a small child, the church for me felt like a safe cocoon with big people gathered all around me, cherishing me, encouraging me, and nourishing me. Sunday school, chair of choir, vacation Bible school, youth group, confirmation class, mission trips, and especially the magic and wonder of worship. All of it was, for me, a pure delight. My favorite part of the worship service was always the offering. Why? Because I could take my shiny nickel and participate by putting that nickel on that velvet lining of the plate. And then as the ushers came forward, I could imagine myself being curled up in that plate, being brought forth as an offering to God. It seems that when I was small, church was about feeling, not thinking. Feeling safe, feeling loved, feeling small in the midst of something very big. Something big that I learned to know and name as God. And so for me, as a child, the church was not an institution, but an experience. But then I grew up. My love affair with the church pushed me into seminary. And all of a sudden, I was a pastor. And I discovered, somewhat painfully, that the church is not always a feeling, or an experience, or even a community of the beloved. The church is an institution, with buildings to maintain, and programs to create, and budgets to manage, and conflicts to mediate, and wonderful, wounded, and sometimes ornery people to serve. I've discovered in my 35 years of pastoral ministry that some of the time, the luminous words of Jesus have little resemblance to the lives we live. And that far from embodying a radical, risky rabbi, we as church all too often are a timid clone of the broken world we are called to serve. So most of my life, I've lived in this tension. The tension, on the one hand, of being an innocent child, basking in the magic and the mystery of the church. And on the other hand, there is the wary adult who knows all too well the institutional dysfunction of the church from time to time. Now, I have sensed, since I met him, that David Mason also lives creatively and very joyfully in the midst of this tension. Rarely have I met a pastor who loves being a pastor more than Dave Mason. Rarely have I sensed such joy. Like David in scripture, the David we heard about this morning, that ruddy, handsome David. Like David in, your, in scripture, your David started out doing something else. The biblical David was a shepherd. This David did something, I can't remember what it was, but it was something before you went into ministry. Few people would have picked out David in scripture, or perhaps David Mason to be anointed. But God had his finger on your David and on the biblical David. 
and both Davids have turned out to play a major role in the unfolding work of creation. Both of them are passionate about ministry. Both of them are effective in taking risks and leading people. And both of them have found sustenance and grace in the powerful gift of music. I want to thank you, Union Saints, this day for honoring your pastor in this way, for taking this opportunity to lift up David's gifts, to acknowledge his contagious joy, and to give thanks to God for his ministry. Not many congregations have the grace to do what you are doing today. So thank you for pulling out all the stops. But even in this congregation, things haven't been and aren't always rosy. After all, we're people. Differences of opinion, conflicts over priorities, financial challenges. It is never easy being the church of Jesus Christ. And it isn't easy to maintain the unity of the spirit that Paul describes this morning from our text from Ephesians. Now in this presbytery, only 23 of our 88 congregations are growing. 15 of our congregations have less than 25 in worship on any given Sunday. And the burden of old, drafty buildings is literally killing many of our faith communities. In many congregations, our young adults are simply wandering away, bored by our worship, tired of our doctrinal squabbles, and unmoved by our Band-Aid mission projects. Yes, for many in our multicultural, multisensory, technological, and very complicated world, the church has simply become irreverent. Irrelevant, not irreverent, irrelevant. What too many people out there see in our churches is order. And what they want is ardor. What too many people hear are answers, when what they bring are questions. What too many people feel from us is fear and anxiety and judgment, when what people today crave is joy and risk and radical welcome. Now let me hasten to assure you, the Congregation of Union in Newburgh, you are in many ways an exception to this depressing portrait of the church. After decline a few years ago, your membership has stabilized and is growing. Your worship attendance, your Christian education enrollment is steady. And your giving remains generous, despite, despite all the fluctuations in the economy. Good for you. A couple of years ago, some presbytery representatives came to meet with your session to hear from you your unique gifts and calling in this day. This is something we do with every congregation in the presbytery at least once every three years. Those of us who visited that evening had a wonderful time, and I have to say that in the over 50 of these visits that I have done in the last five years, the visit here was by far the most wonderful experience that I have had. Out of all those visits, I haven't heard the kind of laughter and the warmth and the possibility that were in that room that night. When those of us left, we summarized the evening in just a few words, offering what we had heard in a brief spiritual portrait description of this congregation. And this is what we said. Union Presbyterian Church is a resurrection community of joy and celebration. With forgiveness and love, you encourage open hearts, open hands, open minds in people of all ages, <coughs> races, and life circumstances. Such a generous portrait of hospitality is rare and precious in today's world. Friends, thank you for being this very lively body of Christ in this place. And yet no congregation is perfect, and all congregations need to take to heart 
Paul's call to the church this day in Ephesians. Yes, today Paul is pretty direct in telling all of us around the world who claim Christ as Lord, calling all of us to grow up. To stop mimicking a world of nostalgia and self-absorption and disunity. To, to start being together the body of Christ. Being the recognizable presence of grace and love and justice in the world. This growing up is what Eugene Peterson calls a spirituality of maturity. A maturity that is especially difficult and especially important when the world is changing so rapidly all around us. Now, younger thinkers and writers have started looking at the different worldviews of those who are under 40, the ones who sociologists call the Gen Xers and the millennial generation. Their findings are telling, and I think give us a clue as to the growing up that God is calling us to do if we are to answer God's high calling to us to be the resurrected body of Christ in the world in the 21st century. Let me just lift up a few of the shifts which congregations who are growing are beginning to embrace. First of all, there is the movement from the head to the heart. From rational sermons and doctrinal Bible studies to small groups built on conversation and relationships and storytelling and prayer. A movement from propriety, this is the proper way to do things, to passion, that which gets our blood flowing and our feet tapping all to the glory of God. Like I was doing 15 minutes ago, and maybe you were too, with those delightful children singing rock and roll in church. <laughs> Amen, union. <laughs> that kind of warmth that from head to heart is also obvious in your prayer, in the shut-in communions, in the many ways you serve those who are sad, in your laughter that seems to be everywhere when I'm ever in this church, and also in those incredibly heartwarming messages that your pastor writes in your newsletter every month. I read every one of them and am always moved. Yes, in this place you understand that faith most of all grows from hearts that are strangely warmed, not heads that are bored to death. The second movement in growing churches is a movement from institution to intimacy. From worrying about budgets and structures and rules to connecting as brothers and sisters in Christ, embracing friendship and not membership as the primary purpose of congregational life. Now you are all blessed and shaped by the architecture of this church structure. Literally having your worship in a ballroom. When are you going to start dancing, friends? <laughs> having your Bible studies in a living room, and in May, bringing the homeless into this space to literally sleep in your bedrooms. My friends, to you, this is a family home, and you have become a family, creating life together in a mansion to experience intimacy and informality instead of institutional rigidity. You know what it means to move from institution to intimacy. The third movement that is clear in congregations that are growing is a movement from maintenance to mission. From a focus on the inside of the church to a focus on the outside of the church. A shift from primarily meeting our own needs to meeting the needs of our neighbors those people that God has given you to serve. And of course you are doing this in so many ways. I asked Dave this morning what all those bags of food in every nook and cranny are. And he told me about your feeding and bringing food to the hospice for AIDS victims. And about the food you take and the 
other things you take into Midtown Newburgh. Your family promise commitment is truly radical and not something every congregation is free to do. Thank you for being so hospitable. The fact that you have reached out in many ways to your Latino neighbors and are experimenting with worship in the Spanish language. Your commitment to Habitat for Humanity. Your vacation Bible school that brings in so many neighbor children. My friends, you also understand what it means to move from maintenance of an institution to mission in the community. But let me remind you that 35% of your neighbors in this zip code have no connection whatsoever to any religious institution. And the average age of your neighbors is 37. What an opportunity to continue to be radically risk-taking about going out and serving your community. So from head to heart, from institution to intimacy, from maintenance to mission, these are the directions that the Spirit is leading the Church of Jesus Christ in the secular Northeast during these drastically changing days of the 21st century. This is the high calling that the Apostle Paul begs us to rediscover, to be worthy of this day. Of course, undergirding all of this is a lifestyle of generosity. And generosity, my friends, is more about spirit than it is about money. If we have truly generous hearts, the money will follow. Brian McLaren is a non-denominational evangelical who has embraced most of the social justice passion of the more liberal Christian church. So he's mystified lots of people who can't figure out which camp he belongs to. Is he a conservative or is he a liberal? He refuses to go there. Instead, he lifts up a vision that embraces the call to unity that we find today in Ephesians. McLaren has written a book called Generous Orthodoxy, but it's the subtitle that I really like. This is the subtitle. Why I am a missional, evangelical, post-Protestant, liberal, conservative, conservative, mystical, poetic, biblical, charismatic, contemplative, fundamentalist, Calvinist, Anabaptist, Anglican, Methodist, Catholic, green, incarnational, depressed, yet hopeful, emergent, and unfinished Christian. <laughs> He's my kind of guy. <laughs> I encourage you to read it. It's a fabulous book. In other words, McLaren has become a generous thinker, realizing that today we live in a both and world, not an either or. We serve a God whose heart is big enough to unconditionally love everyone. A God whose arms are so wide that no one, no one is excluded ever from the abundant feast of life. And so every time we are tempted to be judgmental or unforgiving or cruel to any person or any idea, we are dishonoring the very presence of God in our lives. Such is the call of faithful generosity, the high calling of every Christian. My father, one of the most precious gifts in my life, died four years ago at the ripe old age of 92. Dad was a man who built his life on the foundation of generosity. Always grateful, always gracious to the outcast, welcoming to the stranger. A man who tithed joyfully, giving one-tenth of his income every year, even when his kids were in college. A man who was drenched with prayer and gratitude. A man whose motto when we were growing up was always to be magnanimous. He, more than most people I have known, was worthy of his high calling as a Christian. Somebody who simply embodied a spirituality of maturity. Four days before Dad died from renal failure, we shared, just the two of us, a quiet Sunday morning worship service <coughs> in his hospital room. I asked him what scripture he wanted to consider, and he immediately responded, 
Psalm 103. Go home and read it. And so together, he completely from memory, all 35 verses, and me reading the Bible, together we recited these amazing words about our amazing God. A God whose blessings and benefits shape us, who forgives all our iniquities, who satisfies us with good all the days of our life, whose compassion and steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting. How perfect these words were to describe the deep, abiding faith with which my father lived all the days I knew him and with which he died. And this legacy of generosity is at the very core of my ministry, the ministry that I do to honor my father, but also to give glory to our amazingly generous God. So at 62, I am still in love with the church, but it is no longer child's play. The church is no longer a safe, solid womb to protect me from the world. Instead, the church is, at its best, what our old book of order describes as the provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. Brothers and sisters, in this special place, I encourage you to continue your, to claim your high calling, to be worthy of the abundant blessings that God has poured into your lives. As you begin a second decade as pastor and people, I charge you to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I charge you to equip the saints for ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. To build up the body for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to go out there and transform the world. I charge you to continue to find the courage and the compassion to take risks and to become day by day more like Jesus. May it be so for you, for David, and for God. Amen.